Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. This is Cola Day's weekly column. July 14th, 2019. Can our veggie gardens feed us in a real crisis? Massive flooding and heavier than normal precipitation across the U.S. Midwest this year delayed or entirely prevented the planting of many crops. The situation was sufficiently widespread that it was visible from space. The trouble isn't over yet. Hotter than normal temperatures predicted to follow could adversely affect corn pollination. Projections of lower yields have already stimulated higher prices in UN grain indexes and U.S. ethanol. Additionally, the USDA is expecting harvests to be of inferior quality. Furthermore, the effects of this year could bleed into 2020. Late planting leads to late harvesting, which delays fall tilling, potentially until next spring, when who knows what else Mother Nature will deliver. AccuWeather's characterization of this as a one-of-a-kind growing season is literally true, only in terms of its exact circumstances, given increasingly chaotic events, but not in its intensity, which will surely be exceeded. Prudence would dictate that we heed this year's events as a warning and get serious about making preparations for worse years. Literal cycles of feast or famine have marked agriculture since its birth, and sooner or later we will experience significant shortages here in the U.S., if not from the weather, then from war or lack of resources, or some other reason. The Midwest floods and their possible repercussions for the food supply got some attention in the news, though not enough, and one of the most common suggestions I saw on social media was, plant a garden. If only it were that simple. I used to be a small-scale organic farmer, so take it from me. Totally feeding yourself from your own efforts is very, very challenging. Though some friends and I tried over multiple seasons, we never succeeded, or even came anywhere close. First of all, consider what you eat. Yes, you. What do you eat at home? At work. When you go out. Okay, what percentage of that can be raised in the bioregion where you live? If you have trouble answering that question, don't feel bad. I would guess that the proportion of the U.S. population with practical agricultural knowledge is lower than any other society in history. Looking at the subset of your current diet that can be grown in your area, is it enough to live off of? Is it well balanced and does it provide enough calories? If not, what will you add to fill it up? This is purely an exercise, of course, but there's the rough draft of the menu you're going to survive on. How will that work? I mean, logistically. Let's take carrots, for example. They're popular, they're nutritious, and they can be grown all over the U.S. without too much trouble. What's a year's worth of carrots look like? How many 10-foot rows would it take to produce that much? When are they best seeded? How much space, water, and amendments do they require? What tools do you need? Are there diseases or insects to worry about? And what's the best way of dealing with those? When do you harvest them? How long will they keep? Now go through all of those questions for everything else on your list. Then add it up. All the space, all the hours, all the equipment. Does it look daunting? If it doesn't, you left something out. Without going through all of the above, here's what you're probably not thinking of right now. The typical U.S. American diet is only 10 to 20 percent fruits and veggies, like you might grow in your backyard, and the vast majority is made up of grains and proteins in one form or another. What vegetable does nearly everyone grow in their home garden? Tomatoes. How do people eat them? Often enough, on a sandwich or in pasta. That's wheat, or rice, or some other grains. How many people have ever planted rice or wheat in their backyards? Meat is also grain because that's what's fed to animals. This includes the majority of grass-fed cows who are finished, fattened up that is, on grains on a feedlot prior to slaughter. So if you want meat in your homegrown diet, you'll need to plant for those mouths too. You might end up concluding that you don't need as much meat as you thought you did. By the way, historic Paleolithic diets were supplemented by hunting meat, but were dependent on gathering roots, seeds, and berries, etc., when my friends and I tried the Grow All Your Own Food Challenge, we quickly got educated about the difficulties of grains and other staple crops. I'm not just talking about planting and raising, which are hard enough, but harvesting and processing. Wheat, for example, is easy to grow, but there's a number of steps from mature spikelets in the field to flour in the kitchen, including threshing and winnowing. 
In 2008, we attempted to harvest and process a third of an acre of wheat entirely by hand. Over two dozen people participated during a two-week period. I kept careful notes, and after all was said and done, each hour of labor produced 2.6 pounds of wheat berries, cleaned and ready to grind. To put that into perspective in the context of our current capitalist mode, if you were paying people $15 an hour, the labor cost of each pound would be $5.77. We also experimented with quinoa, dry beans, flour corn, millet, buckwheat, flax, and other crops. Each one required its own set of techniques. Overall, our yields were much lower than we expected and the work much harder than we wanted. Not to say that I didn't enjoy it, I did, but I also wasn't actually depending on it. When I think about the possibility of some kind of food supply crisis in the U.S., all I can do is shake my head. We do not have a safety net to catch us if we fall. If we want one, we needed to start working on it yesterday. Just putting in another raised bed in your backyard ain't going to do it. You can't live off of spinach, cucumbers, and green beans. You can survive just on potatoes if you have to, but guaranteeing year-round availability is tricky. I'm not saying you shouldn't plant veggie gardens. We should put in as many as we can and fight to keep them when they're threatened. But let's not kid ourselves that a few heads of broccoli or even a wheelbarrow of zucchinis will get us through an actual breakdown of the agricultural system. It won't. If we want a shot at doing that, we need to put in some meaningful time and effort, and it will necessarily be outside the system. I gave it a try for a few years with a bicycle-based urban farming operation in Portland, Oregon. It was a hell of a lot of fun, see my book, Adventures in Urban Bike Farming, but had no lasting effect. Of the 40-some gardens that we got going, only one remains that I know of eight years later. I suspect that the warning we've received from Mother Nature this year about the vulnerability of our agricultural system will go unheeded. If we were smart, we would be reorganizing the whole kit and caboodle around small-scale operations and localized food sheds. It wouldn't be rocket science, but it wouldn't be making Cargill, Tyson, and Monsanto rich. Which just goes to show again, if we want to survive and we're serious about it, what we really need is a revolution. If you enjoyed this reading today, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. To find out about the other podcasting I do, visit radiofreesunroot.com. <laughs>